Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We will now start actually our last public lecture this autumn in the Alta University's uh, Internet Forum public lecture series. And I have to tell you that uh, we are having very high profile lecturers here in Alta University at this moment. The next lecture hall, just a few tens of meters, uh, Erkki Liikanen from Finland's bank is starting his presentation. And we here in this lecture hall will very soon hear the lecture from uh, Risto Silasma from F-Secure and Nokia Cooperation, and then also lecture from Petri Aaltonen from FICOM. And I have to say that at the moment they are happening, as you know, a lot of events, a lot of uh, lectures uh, in Helsinki area. I just came from the first ever organized Mill Schlush, the Schlush side event which was concentrating on the military and the security startups here in Finland. And I have to say that when I was looking and hearing these 14 excellent uh, innovative startups uh, from Finland, I have to say that if someone comes to me and says that we can't be innovative and we can't sell ourselves, they are wrong, especially when I looked at those startups. But this public lecture here today is not the last public event organized by the Aalto University this autumn. We are very soon, 8th of December, discussing uh, with several experts like Harri Hursti, Mikko Hyppönen, Mikko Särelä, Kimmo Rousku and Lea Viljanen. We are discussing that how secure the digital voting can be. What are the main challenges when we are digitalizing more or less everything, including voting systems, maybe in the coming years. And this is a public event. And as this one, if you can't come to the lecture hall, which is at this uh, time in Töölö campus in Helsinki, this can be followed also by a live stream in internet. So most welcome to there also. But without further notice, we will go to the first lecture. Today we are talking about the future, especially the digital future. And <clears throat> I, I know that it's very wide area to give this kind of topic to the lecturers. That hey, please tell us your vision, your thoughts, what the future will look like, especially, especially from the digital uh, point of view. And that's why I think that we are all very eager to hear what Risto Silasma and Petri Aaltonen has to say to us. So Risto Silasma, please, welcome very much to the Aalto University and floor is yours. Thank you. So good evening, everybody. Let's make this a dialogue rather than a lecture. So please raise your hands, shout in between, challenge me and comment. Let's make this interactive. I'll start with taking a business point of view. In business, one often thinks that there are certain things you can rely on. This business has been conducted for thousands of years and there are certain things that remain the same such as that you need to have certain assets when you sell services or products to customers. You need to own the core assets yourself. But of course, we all know that that's not true anymore. Airbnb is a great example of that. Airbnb has 16, 600 employees, and they manage about half a million rooms. Hilton which is the largest hotel group, has about a third of a million employees, and they manage about 600,000 rooms. And you can guess which company is more valuable. I'm sure it feels a little bit unfair to the Hilton family. Marginal costs are always higher, higher than zero. So if you produce more, you pay more, they say at least a, a marginal increase in costs when you increase volumes. 
Actually, that's not true anymore. Let's, let's take Google, for example. You could say that there's a fractional additional cost for an additional search query. But if you take into account the improvements in efficiency that they create through processors getting cheaper and more powerful, actually over time they save much more than what they need to produce those extra volumes. You could say that media company needs to employ journalists who create content. You all know what, what is the, the world's largest media company at the moment. What is it? Facebook, by far. 1.5 billion readers or customers. And of course, Facebook doesn't employ people who create content. Core services need to be delivered by your own people. Well, Uber doesn't employ the people who drive the cars, and they don't even own the cars at the moment that are being driven. Competition takes years to emerge and scale up. Let's take Spotify. It came out of the blue and revolutionized the music industry in just a few years. And how old is the music industry? People in that industry, I'm sure, felt that nothing will change the way this business is conducted. There will be new medias. The old LPs will be replaced by, by digital versions, CDs, and so forth. But there will not be a fundamental revolution in the business model. But of course, there, there has been. And you feel that the disruption, when it comes, it comes from people in your own industry, people that you have probably known, you have competed with them, or you have worked with them for years. But let's take Tesla, completely outside the automotive industry. And Elon Musk had pretty much nothing to do with the automotive industry before he started this company. And you might feel that if you are big enough, you are secure. Kodak employed 175,000 people in 1998. They had 85% of the photo paper market. And they made margins of over 60% in that worldwide market. And just a few years later, they went bankrupt. So what's happening? Why is this change so radical? I think all industries are being disrupted. All major industries will be disrupted. And it's just hard for us to see how that happens. And there's a very simple reason for that. Much of this is happening because of exponential technology development. And we are very poor in understanding exponential developments. A very easy example of this is, imagine you are sitting in the world's largest sports stadium. You're sitting on the top row. You take your binoculars and you look down onto the grass in the middle of the arena and you see a water hose. And there's one drop of water that you see dropping out of that, the end of the hose. The next minute, there will be two drops of water. The third minute, there will be four. The fourth minute, eight, and so forth. How long do you think it will take before your feet get wet? What would you guess? Just roughly. Now, this is the same old story, but the Indian Maharaja who said that, see, if I lose in the war to you, I'll pay you one rice grain on the first rectangle on the chessboard and two on the second and four on the third one and so forth. So how long will it take, roughly? Guess. Well, five minutes, that would be 32 drops of water. Wouldn't do that much. Or actually it would be a little bit more, but not much. Three hours. About 45 minutes. And, of course, you can, you can feel how difficult it is to estimate that. 
even though you can just take a calculator and you can calculate it. It's, it's really easy math. What is actually much more difficult than what we already did is when you are sitting in that stadium and 44 minutes have gone and you see the stadium half full, the level of the water is still way below you. You feel quite safe and you don't realize that in one minute your feet will get wet. That is the, the difficulty. Do you know which company invented the digital camera? It was Kodak. The first digital camera had a resolution of 100 times 100 pixels, so 10,000 pixels altogether. All and of course, the quality was very, very poor. But that was tens of years ago. And in just a few years from inventing that, the quality was already much better. It didn't take a genius to understand that with the constant development, which already was exponential at that time, you could almost guarantee that one day digital photography will be far superior to film. You wouldn't need to be a genius to say that. You could even take a ruler and just draw a straight line, a linear development, and say when at the latest it should happen. And yet, still the same company that invented the first digital camera at the end of the 90s in their board meeting, management team meeting, they discussed the future of digital photography. And they said that as our margins on the photo paper are so high, we will not change our business model. And what happened, can I actually draw here? I haven't drawn on this old-fashioned blackboard in a very long time. So this is the number of photographs taken in the world. That's roughly how it looks like. It's a nice exponential curve. This is the number of film photographs taken in the world. And it happened so quickly. It's the 44th minute. Things were quite well up to here. They should have seen the, the water level sort of down there, but the quality of digital cameras was still so poor that they were not worried. But if they had just thought a little bit, if they had really wanted to understand what is happening, it would have been obvious that very soon the digital cameras will be completely superior. So what's wrong with, our, with us human beings? That we don't use what seems to be common sense. So let's think about transportation. Do you know how many people are killed every year in traffic accidents? It's about 1.25 million people, and about 50 million people are hospitalized. Can you imagine how much that costs? In the countries where traffic safety is poorest, up to 5% of GDP is spent on the costs created by traffic accidents. Think about that, 5% of GDP. In Finland, all healthcare costs are below 10% of GDP. So think about in, in a country where half of all healthcare costs in Finland, are proportional to that, would be spent just on costs caused by traffic accidents. It's very easy to estimate that with self-driving cars, with the, the advanced sensors, with the ability to share sensor data between cars, traffic accidents will almost disappear one day. And that will also enable carpooling to up to a level that we haven't seen before. Like Kutsu Plussa, 
which was a great idea in, in Finland. Small minibuses, which were constantly, real-time, automatically rerouted to pick up people who wanted a lift. You paid basically a bus ticket price and you got a taxi service. You just sat in the same car with a few other people. If that would be a self-driving car, it would drive 24 hours a day almost, charging maybe an hour every day. I have a fleet of those. The cars would be constantly moving. They wouldn't need parking places. Our streets would be unjammed, even in places like Beijing. And there would, wouldn't be many traffic accidents anymore. A car is not a driving machine. Do you know what a car is? It's not meant to, meant to be driven. It's meant to be parked. A car is parked more than 95%. It's a parking machine. Isn't that crazy? It's the second most expensive item we, most of us, buy. And 95% of the time we park it somewhere. And we typically pay to park it separately. An additional fee to park it. Doesn't make much sense. In some congested cities, studies indicate that many drivers spend up to 30% of their time just for looking for parking places. American people spend 6.9 billion hours in traffic jams in a year. Think about what they could do with that time. If that 6.9 billion hours would be spent working or having fun. But of course, we can't all have electric cars if energy production doesn't change and our ability to transfer that energy from the production sites to people who need it. Solar panels, which by the way were invented by Nokia. Did you know that? Invented by Bell Labs, actually, which is part of Nokia. The fundamental invention was by, by Bell Labs. And actually also the, the photosensitive cell was invented by Bell Labs. So digital cameras were also invented by Nokia, almost. But the solar cell is an exponential technology. Again, it has been in existence for a very long time, and if you just plot it, plot the cost and the efficiency you will see that it's developing exponentially. And over the last few years, it has reached levels where in many countries, it's cheaper to produce energy with at home for private people with solar panels than it is to take the energy from the grid. And if you think about that exponential development continuing, it means that the the line of parity, parity meaning that you pay the same cost for solar energy produced by yourself than you pay for the electricity from the grid. That is coming north. I don't know whether solar energy will ever be a great way to produce energy in Finland, but if that development continues, then definitely it will. Of course, we need to be a bit paranoid, always thinking that how long will the exponential development continue? But if we don't have any reason to, to say that it will stop, then we should at least take into account the possibility that it will continue. Now think about a, a Tesla. Even an older Tesla has storage capacity of 85 kilowatt hours. Think about a million of those cars. How much storage capacity do they have combined? How much does a 
a Finnish nuclear power plant produce energy? Who knows? Yeah, 1,000 megawatts in a, for example, in Lovisa, Ydinvoimala. So basically, we could have 85 of those producing energy for an hour, and we could st store all that in those Teslas. And of course, we know that the batteries actually degrade quite quickly if we keep on charging them and draining them all the time. But basically, you could say that with developing battery technology, we could have a way to use solar energy to charge batteries that are distributed uh, close to where the consumption is, at people's houses, and perhaps in, in smaller businesses. And we reduce the need for huge investments into the grid. We can still have a smart grid. And a Tesla or any similar car, it's actually an IoT device. So very easily controlled remotely. In, in Teslas, the actual batteries are the same size as a mobile phone battery. There's just a lot of them. And they have a separate processor for every battery to control the charging and discharging of that particular battery. So you can actually control it down to the, the fairly low granular level. Healthcare. Do you know how many hospital beds are monitored? Of course, all the intensive care unit beds are monitored very well. And you would think that there would be an integrated system, that all the, the measurements that are taken from you are somehow combined, and the doctors and the staff can, can read them. Unfortunately, that's not true. Typically, the systems are isolated from each other especially the older ones. And then when the patient is taken to the general ward, only less than 10% of the beds are monitored. And the patient comes with a stack of paper, which are printed from the equipment in the intensive care unit, and can't be transferred to the monitoring systems in the general ward. And when the patient goes home, of course, there's no monitoring anymore. And using today's technology, it would be very easy to move that monitoring to people's homes as well, being able to release people from the hospital much sooner. And that would be great because hospitals are the places where people get sick. Hospitals are extremely unhealthy places to be. So when you have to go to a hospital, go home as soon as you can. And if you could combine the same level of monitoring that you would be under in the hospital while going home, that would be ideal. And technology is definitely not preventing that. And that's what we are doing in Nokia as well. We are starting from both the clinical end as well as the consumer fitness end. And typically, the sensors are the same. The regulatory process is very different, but the sensors themselves are the same. And as we improve the quality of the consumer products, we can actually start providing the same level of sensor readings and sensor data that one gets in the hospitals. Plus, what we have never gotten from the hospitals is the big data, the ability to put all that data from all those sensors in one place and then start looking for correlations in that, that data mass based on what you see happening to the, the people. Who gets diabetes? What was happening in their data before? All the hundreds of millions in, of the people in the world who have diabetes. How could we have perhaps prevented it or at least predicted it a 
few years before they were diagnosed, or Alzheimer's or any of the other chronic diseases that are actually the most costly to treat. And that is a very interesting opportunity. When we had the first industrial revolution with mechanical power, steam engines, what would you guess it took for the spindle, the first sewing machine, to spread globally? It was invented in Europe. How long would it, would, did it take for it to spread to other continents? It took 120 years. In the second industrial revolution with electricity and the assembly line, of course, the spread of that technology was much, much faster. But still today, 17% of the people in the world live without electricity. 17%. So even in these more than 100 years, we have not reached even close to 100%. The third, computers and the internet. There's still about 4 billion people who don't have internet access. But more than 95% of the people in the world live within reach of networks. So the internet is, is almost completely global as a technology. Not all people have access to it. And that's a cost issue and a learning issue. There are three billion people in the world who can't read. Think about how close we are to the situation where you can talk to your mobile phone and it will talk back to you. You don't have to read anymore. Think about what that would mean to those three billion people who either cannot read at all or read very poorly they could start learning in a completely new way. So technology truly can mean a huge, huge deal to people, even quite small things. And of course, we all know that what is becoming digital today will be cognitive tomorrow. And that will, be a, that will be an exciting ride. How many of you understand what deep learning actually does? Hands up. One hand came up. There are many fascinating examples where we have set up these combinations of deep learning and some other technologies to, to create an artificial intelligence program on a particular subject, like language translation or proposing responses to incoming emails or, or whatever. And then we get surprised by the outcome. For example, a solution that proposes responses for you for your incoming emails would end the message by saying, I love you, with its proposal to a business partner. And then the people who coded that, who taught the deep learning machine, have absolutely no idea why did it say that. There's, there's no time to, to go into to why that is, but the fact is that it's a black box, pretty much. You can see inside the black box, but you don't understand what you see. It's just a huge, huge amount of numbers that link to each other. And you don't, we cannot understand exactly how. And then the only thing we can do when we see that kind of odd behavior that we don't actually want, we reteach the machine. This is actually not the desired outcome. All these learning machines have a, a goal function. We somehow need to help the machine to understand what is a desirable outcome. 
so that when it experiments, when it tries, when we teach it, and when it teaches itself, it can, it can grade how good, it, how good a outcome it got, and then it can optimize its own behavior further. Think about what's happening now. We have a huge number of these projects ongoing. Nokia is involved in it. Bell Labs does a lot of it. F-Secure has been using deep learning for, for a number of years. I mean, it, everywhere. And let's imagine that there's a particular team somewhere in the world that is now further ahead in this than anybody else. And they are working on a piece of software that is really good in coding, writing software code, optimizing the performance of software. And of course, the, the humans car carry a huge part of that load for a time until the software actually becomes better than the humans who kicked it off. And then the software itself will start improving its own ability to code and to improve the quality of code for a particular purpose. And when it reaches that point, just by adding capacity, taking more data centers, that process can be very, very quick. It can be exponential. And what happens after that point is really only a function of the available resources. And that's, that's quite scary. And we don't really understand what it means. We lack perspective on measuring the intelligence. Of course, this, this is a very specialized intelligence. We're talking about only the kind of intelligence that can augment intelligence or augment its ability to do this one special thing. But if we take a, a programmer and we measure his abilities using some rude metrics such as IQ, then we have some sort of an idea of what 150 means or 200 means. But do we have any idea what 6,500 means? We have absolutely no idea. It's the same differences between a beetle and a human being. And the beetle doesn't understand the power of the human brain. And think about the goal function. It basically can be whatever. Nick Bostrom talks about an artificial intelligence that is created to manufacture paper clips. And it tries to do that as well as it can. The goal function can be really anything. Think about an alien landing on, on Earth, a slimy green alien. It actually is probably quite close to human beings in many ways. It most likely is influenced by Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Because it's a living organism. It breeds. It wants to be safe. It wants to feed. An artificial intelligence has none of these needs. It will be much more alien, or it can be much more alien, than the slimy green one. So we have an AI and the slimy green alien. Why can't the AI have similar goals to the, the slimy green alien? Think about the paperclip artificial intelligence. So it wants to manufacture paperclips. If we define the goal function poorly, it may want to design the maximum number of paperclips. If it becomes super intelligent, it wants to maximize that. So basically everything on Earth becomes a tool to manufacture more paperclips. Maybe even humans can be worth something in that. The raw material in us. 
to manufacture paper clips. And maybe the end result will be Dyson spheres around the suns in the nearby solar systems, capturing all the energy of those suns in order to, to manufacture the maximum number of paper clips. How do we define the goal function in such a way that we won't run into trouble? If you think about an AI that wants to design paper clips, the maximum number, it wants to be secure because it understands that the function of time is very important. The longer it lives, the more paper clips it can manufacture. So any threat to longevity is a threat to its goal function. So it, it will have a need to protect itself. And how can it protect itself? What can, what can be a threat? It will have the resources to try to protect itself from even the most remote threats. For example, us. And there are so many fascinating thought processes in this. You might say that the artificial intelligence that is only created to create better programs, software code, would never expand outside that. But actually, it might very easily have a need to do that. Because in order to, to do the, the maximum job in its goal function, it, of course, can do more if it has more computing power. And how does it get more computing power? It can buy it. It could, for example, create hacking skills, steal money to buy more computing power. It can create social engineering skills so that it can convince people to give it more computing power. It can create sort of strategizing skills so that it can think very far ahead in how does it get access to maximum computing power. How do we start building more and more data centers just for it. It may learn to lie in order to convince us to help it to reach its goal function. I'm not saying that any of this will, will happen, but be warned by the exponential development and how poor we humans are in understanding how soon the water will touch our feet. And if we have a piece of software that, is, that, that the intelligence of is only limited by the computing capacity it has available to develop itself further, the development can be very, very fast. It can be that we have something that has an IQ of 100 today there's an IQ of 150 next Monday. There's an IQ of 500 next Tuesday. There's an IQ of 10,000 next Tuesday night. And then legislators will be left far behind. So we need to start thinking about both the positives and negatives of technology early enough. Now let me just say a couple of words about cybersecurity, as, as that sort of has been a theme in this lecture series as well. The thing that worries me most is that all low-tech is now becoming high-tech. All the engine manufacturers, all the manufacturers of, of windows and car tires and you name it, they are all becoming high-tech companies producing high-tech products. They are all connecting their product, products to the internet. And many of them are doing it very, very badly. F-Secure has a tool called Riddler, which we use to scan the entire address space in IPv4 
twice every week. And you can use that to look for new computers, new, new apps, new ser services on the internet. And it's very easy to find a water dam in Norway, which has a control interface wide open to the internet, a diesel power plant in Germany that has the same, an ice hockey hall in Finland where if you don't like the team that practices there, just melt the ice and they will find it much harder to practice. And of course, homes are wide open. The ability to code securely is not easy. It's very difficult. And these companies that are not digitally native, and they have not employed digitally native people, will find it very hard to do. And we have all seen a lot of examples of that. I was in, actually in China today, but a couple of months ago when I was in China, I heard an interesting story about rubber trees that were hacked in Indonesia. They really hack rubber trees. Can anybody guess why? They've inserted sensors into the rubber trees in the plantations to measure the production of rubber. And each tree has a sensor. And they, these hackers drive by the plantation reading the sensor readings. Why do they do that? Why have they hacked into the trees? They sell the information. Who, who will pay for that? People trading in rubber futures are paying for it. So even rubber trees are hacked nowadays. Think about that. And for money. I think we are out of time. And I haven't heard many questions during the, this dialogue that we have had. <laughs> but I think there's time for at least one or two. Go ahead. My name is Simo Salo. One question. You wrote that curve on the blackboard, and uh, there is one curve which is uh, uh, troubling the world nowadays. It's the, the rise of the global immigration. Can you see that you will find any, any medicine for that, for instance, using the uh, deep learning, sharing the wellness of the world in a, in a fair way, or, or, or any other remedy. Yeah. Until the very end, I thought you were talking about the rise in the global temperature. But then you said immigration. Yeah. Immigration or refugees are, of course, a, a big problem. I don't think we need artificial intelligence to solve that. Human intelligence and emotional intelligence is more necessary. And think about just the following It hasn't fact. worked so far. Yeah, that, that is true. But think about the following fact. There are about 6.5 million Syrian refugees dislocated from their homes within Syria, and about the same number in the neighboring countries. And there are camps that Western countries pay for to house those refugees. And it currently costs roughly, I think, $8 per month to feed one refugee. And they only have five. So people are starving in many of those camps. Think about yourself with your children living in those camps and your children are starving. And that's fairly low in the Maslow's hierarchy. So it's no surprise that you want to move anywhere. Even if you want to go back to your home, 
as soon as it's possible. But you can't stay in those camps if you don't even get fed. How much does it cost us when those hundreds of thousands of people or millions of people come to Europe? And how little it would cost us to feed them well in those camps? And still, we deliberately set things up so that the people are almost forced to come to Europe. So we are just making this very difficult for ourselves. And it would not be that difficult to at least mitigate. There are so many low-hanging fruits, and we still fail to grasp them. Anybody else? This is apparently mostly a Finnish audience because people are so quiet. Uh, so in this future, which you just described us, what would be your message to the students or the young people who are thinking about their future and their careers, their jobs? What's your main message for them? Well, I, I believe in, in working on the issues that make you worried. Let's not sit down, lean back and complain. Let's do something about it. What worries you, start working on it. We can all do quite a lot. If you're worried about the availability of energy, clean energy, start working on it. Do what you can. Make it your life's mission. And I guarantee that you will be happier than if you just sit back, sit down, lean back and complain. Yeah, super. Thanks for an interesting uh, presentation. My name is Nina Rudanko and uh, out of these big uh, trends which we have now, like big data and uh, artificial intelligence, also blockchain is, is one uh, topic mm. which is very much um, being researched now. So uh, have you had time to have a look at that? And if yes, what kind of future do you think that will, uh, will that like help solving the cybersecurity issues or, or make things worse? Well, I don't see how it could make things worse. It, it could even solve the electronic voting issues. You can, you can, of course, use blockchain for a very wide variety of things, because it's basically a very simple technology. It's a very fundamental technology, where you can just ensure the integrity of the, of the data and distribute it in such a way that no single party can, can falsify that data. I know many, many CEOs of big banks. I have taken it as a habit to, to tease them by asking them, do you actually know what blockchain is? Do you really know what, what, it, what it is? And many of them really don't. It's delegated. There are people in the organization who, who are working on it. And I have been trying to tell them that hey, it's your responsibility to understand it as well. You need to know yourself because it's so relevant to your business. Don't, you don't want to be the one who acts surprised when it blows in your face. It's a little bit the same as when I meet with CEOs and we discuss cybersecurity. They pretty much all say that it's one of the things keeping me up awake at night. And then I typically ask them, okay, can you name the three most valuable targets for a hacker inside your company? The kind of information systems or processes that if disrupted will cause the maximum damage. Can you name those? And very, very few can. So if you don't even know how your business is vulnerable, to hackers, then what the heck are you saying that it keeps you up awake at night? What are you doing at night then? If you're not sleeping, why don't you find out? And again, it's my organization knows, but I, actually in many cases, even they don't know. because They have not gone to the trouble. And my advice to them is that do a workshop, decide which are the, the most 
vulnerable, most important targets in your company, and then have a red team attack those. Hire an external company to hack into those systems. See how far they get. And I guarantee that you will be not pleasantly surprised by the outcome. F-Secure does a lot of red team attacks and so far our success rate is 100%. And typically it's not even hugely difficult. And it's scary. Like a major bank, global bank, get access to our online banking source code, get root access to our key mainframe, get physical access to the CEO's office so that you can undisturbed do what you want in that office, get full access to the CEO's email, and relatively easy. And banks spend a lot on security. Yes, I, I studied one, one story because once a while we arrived uh, at a turning point where decision can impact industries uh, for generations to come. And back uh, to the uh, 1882, Charles Alexander III thought that telephone was mainly for that kind of chit chat not real importance as opposed to telegraph, which was very vital, vital for the government. So he lets, let the Finns decide themselves uh, what to do with the te telephone. And this lack of state regulation, state regulation uh, made the Finnish telephone markets different from the other European countries because we have also these local private, a lot of local private companies. And, and I, I, I say that that's became the most competitive uh, telecom markets in, in Finland because of that uh, uh, lack of state regulation and state control. And in the late, late 1980s when, when these mobile phones come to the market, I think we benefited that from a lot. And you can see this. Oh. Sorry, pictures. From there, in Finland, we are, we are lowest prices in the mobile data and uh, the usage of the data consumption in, in, in the the largest. So this is, I think, a very good platform for the, for the providing services. And I can say thanks, Char. Yes, my name is Petri Altonen from FICOM, and FICOM is a Finnish Federation for Communications and, and Teleinformatics. Uh, we are basically a lobbying organization, aims to drive digitalization, create business, opportunities for Finland and our member companies. Uh, FICOM members are digital enablers, but also targets for digitalization like teleoperators. We, you all know that what's, what's up services are doing with uh, text messaging and so on. Now, this digitalization or in internet of everything is rapidly changing everything around us and we are again around that kind of turning point where decision made or not made will impact our future for a long time. Risto Silasma said that many, many industries are, are facing this digitalization. As digitalization opens up vast amount of new opportunities to transform uh, industry, industries 
and I, our lives, it also comes with the major challenge. Too many options. The amount of, of, of possible options is overwhelming, and new options are opening every day. And, and also this fourth industrial revo revolution, we can say that it makes possible the impact of the fully scalable cloud-based technology that makes processing power available to everyone, everywhere, with reasonable price. But do the vast amount of these possible parts uh, are posed companies with many key questions. What should we do next? Which options should we take? Or which pets you should make for our future? You would think that digitalization is greeted with open arms as it opened up a vast amount of new business op opportunities. But I can say that the picture is, however, much, much more complex. Do the economical uncertainties involved resistant to change, fear of new competition, and just simple inflexibility like organizational silos, focus on operational day-to-day -day management, target a reward system, and so on. And many companies and, and, and even whole industries are de in defense and, for example, pushing governments for new regulation to stop or at least slow down the change. But if you think that digitalization is like force of nature, do, do you think this approach will succeed in the wrong, wrong in the, in the long run. I do not uh, uh, believe it. I can share a few of my observations and, and, and my own experience why it is creating new digital business is so difficult. Uh, I can share my observation from the three areas from the corporates. I've been worked in, in Posti about 15 years in regulation perspective and at the personal as a, as, a, as a leader. As you know, in the digital world, digitally means simply that the customer is really the king. Every company said that their main value is customer focus and so on, but in real life, it's very, very difficult to build a truly customer-focused businesses if your competitive advantage is in production or operational ex efficiency and so on, like my former em employee Posti. And the world changed so frantically and new technolo technologies are available to everyone. It's very, very difficult to know what to do in a world where everything is, is possible. It, and also, its company has only limited invest, investment capabilities and focusing your resources right in a complex world is very, very challenging. And typically, corporate in incentive systems strive to maximize the yearly profits also. And the older generation like me, I think it's very, very difficult to think digitally, really. And, and, and leadership teams are often cut from the same cloth about 15 year old. I think personally that every leadership team in big corporates also have one million, millennial in, in their management board. In this kind of turning point, uh, in, in the regular the approach is, is, is also very, very important. In European, regulator, regulator always tries to usually think beforehand a uh, solution to the possible problems. In USA, I think regulation approach works in the other way around. Solutions are created for problems that have appeared. In the 
old uh, analog world, this may be worked, but no more in the new digital work, because we don't know where the world is going to go, to, and then too detailed uh, regulation is, is impossible. For that reason, it makes sense to, to concentrate on general approach instead of this kind of specific regulation. In good regulation, I have a very good and used example is, is Liikennekaari, which combines the ski traffic regulation into a one. Uh, this Liikennekaari uh, process, real starting point for this legislative work was Uber's entry to the Finnish taxi market because existing taxi legislation do not take into account this new way of doing business. Uh, the regulation work also included a lot of hearings from the wide group of stakeholders, as always this kind of regulatory process have, but the final preparation uh, was mainly done by a uh, roundtable uh, discussion led by uh, new Minister Anne, Anne Berner. And I was, I was also in the round table discussions. Uh, almost, I have to say that the almost all leading traffic uh, lobbying organization were more or less against the change. Typically they're using the, 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 key, the key argument that they are jeopardized the service levels in the rural areas. They are also often using that kind of argument when you are against the competition. Also, they give an impression that they are only real experts in these traffic business issues and other stakeholders were not. But we, FICOM, as a digitalization driver, we were supporting this change and change initiative because change would happen in, in, in in any case. Liikennekaari is also a good example how this digital age regulation should look like. Tear down uh, regulation and streamlining administration and opening competition. This is the right way to do, get the possible desirable outcomes, uh, new business models and, and, and so on. But I can see the big fight in the horizon uh, at the moment. Many companies will take a regulation as a weapon ag against the chains. Already many EU, EU regulation initiatives seems to be focused on protecting existing business models. And, 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 and because in many cases Europe is stayed behind the Asia and, and, and USA companies, for example, this platform, platform economy. Digitalization also requires a constant experimentation and, and, and failing, and big corporations do not have time testing out of new opportunities, opportunities. You should immediately generate 10 million revenues and so on from the new business. So, so and also this cannibalization of our own business is very, very, very difficult. As, uh, as we know, if you don't make it, it's for sure that somebody else, somebody else do it. I have one good example and one success story in, in my for, former employee was, was a story that we launched this parcel automati automatization network in, in, in in 2010, and, but, but our own postal network personnel and, and trade unions were very, very against this, this, this new network because it's cannibalized their own their job. And th th there's a very tough, tough uh, debate in, in, in our, our company in that, that time. But I think at the moment we can see that that was the right, right decision at the moment and, and Posti has, this, has 
already this market share, big market share in this parcel business, and, and this is one of the reason why they are this still still in the market leader in, in the parcel business. The rapidly changing new world requires a lot of new way of thinking, new ideas, courage to take new opportunities, and this startup culture in, in, in Finland is the perfect candidate for, for the job. And companies and industries uh, need new talent and fresh ideas. Now they do not have the time to wait 10 or 20 years for young, bright minds like most of you are th there in the hall to climb the corporate ladder to reach decision-making position. And I would like to, to make two promises today. And one is, is that, that I will continue to challenge unnecessary regulation that creates barriers on new innovations and new business opportunities. And two, I will also influence the companies that I work with to hire or use more millennials and younger talent to decision making, making, making positions. Personally, I, I think that every leadership team should have at least uh, one under 20 member in, in because the change is so, so, so huge at the, at the moment. Do you remember this, this, this uh, phone boots? The last phone boots were scrapped in Finland 2009 as mobile phones had made them obsolete. However, uh, European Union legislation still has included number of regulation phone boots as universal service obligation up to 2015. What is this the learning? The learning is that due to very low reaction times, a lot of regulation focus, especially in EU level, on old business models and old business practices. But the innovators and startups should not see, I think, this old regulation as an impregnable wall, but merely an obstacle to jump over to go around to drive industries and our society to the future. Thank you. Thank you. You were a lot quicker than I thought. Yeah. Uh, a, a very interesting talk. And uh, I think uh, we might have some uh, questions, questions or comments here in the audience. Uh, Lisa Niemi. Hi, I wondered, uh, because you were talking about this resistance and uh, mm. the difference between Europe and Asia and the US, where do you think originally comes this uh, very big resistance all over in Europe and uh, that we want to stick to the old? Uh, maybe one, one reason, as, as I mentioned, is that, uh, that, uh, that the U.S. companies and, and Asia companies are, uh, they are winning these European companies in, in, in many, many areas. And this is that kind of defense mechanism. And other way is that kind of, kind of uh, regulation culture which we have in, 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 in Europe. And, and I remember then late 1990s when these new development and Finland also joining is, it was this common market and I think there's very, very positive, positive speed in Europe. But at, at the moment, I, I can see these directives and, and which comes from the European, they are looking back and, and they want to protect new old business models and so on. I can see that kind of development at the moment and, and that worries me. Any other questions? No? Okay. 
then I guess uh, I, I will be thanking you for, for the great speech. Uh, for the audience here, this uh, and uh, in the internet as well, uh, this is the end of this uh, public lecture series, and also the end of the course internet forum, except for the exams that are that are forthcoming. Uh, more information on the exams will be on the course uh, my my courses page in the future. Unfortunately, there's not much information at the moment, but there will be at some point in the future. As soon as I get it, I will put it there, but I unfortunately don't have the information myself. Uh, on behalf of uh, all our speakers and uh, all, all the course personnel, thank you. Thank you.